obviously thanks to you, John, for making this opportunity and this uh, space possible. So, um, okay, I would like to begin by presenting the title of uh, this space, of this workshop. So it's uh, Assessment Embracing Fetter Practices in the ELT Classroom. And um, to begin with, I would like to display the agenda for um, this space. So uh, we are going to be addressing all together four points throughout this session. Um, initially, we will concentrate on past past, recent past, and present now. Um, afterwards, we will move forward to the conceptualization on language assessment. We will bring upon uh, some of the terminology that most of us must be familiar with when uh, talking about assessment. Later on, we will start uh, making connections with the terminology and also our uh, daily life practices in the classrooms. And we will finish with uh, some challenges and opportunities that from research and the experience that I have been able to share with some of my colleagues at the university, uh, we have come to uh, gather throughout these years. Um, there is a resource available for you. I will enlarge the image on the next slide. Uh, this QR code is for everyone to access. If you're able to do it now, perfect. Um, if not, I will be based in the link here in the chat box if you are from a computer. And uh, this is going to lead us to a Padlet where we will have the chance to answer um, some questions. As I suggest in the reminders section, this is not a workshop. I mean, this is a workshop, not a lecture. And for that reason, I want that your voice is heard and you can participate attentively. Um, I was telling John that we are going to have a moment in which we will go to some breakout rooms. And even though it will not be the only time where there will be interaction, um, I think your reflections are going to be nurturing our understanding um, of this agenda. So with that being said, allow me to show you the larger image and please you can already display the padlet so i will refer to the parts we can find in it um, in the padlet there are three questions the first one says what do i know about assessment second one what do i want to know about assessment and the third one what lessons have i consolidated um, today so the first question that I want you to address is uh, number one, what do I know about assessment? So we're going to take one minute to write some of the ideas that we have on language assessment, anything that comes to mind, anything that you have been able to um, work with in the past, um, any concept that you remember from um, assessment. And let me say this, while some of you are writing down on the Padlet, if you feel like participating orally, um, go ahead and do it, okay? You can also turn on the microphone right now and tell us what is your understanding of language assessment. So please, uh, the floor is open for anyone who wants to start uh, contributing in our space. Okay, I see some um, people writing down on the format already. Let's see what publications, what posts we can get from them. I had, uh, yes, I have one here. It says, um, it is connected with the process and it is more uh, qualitative. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. Let's see what other uh, perceptions um, can we get. Uh, Professor John, uh, what idea concept do you have on on language assessment or something that catches your attention on language assessment 
Professor, I would say that is a, big, uh, a very big field of knowledge. In previous years, maybe it was more like summative, let's say. It was more center of numbers. But nowadays, maybe it's more like formative. Maybe uh, people, scholars, academics like you, you are trying to promote alternative assessment model processes that take into account uh, maybe the context, particularities, specificities of people and the context in which they are involved. So I would say it's a very like a wide area of knowledge uh, that serves to continue like promoting processes, like processes as such, not only like products, but also like processes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I like that. And, and actually, the second post we have on this question uh, comes from a teacher and she says, assessment is, uh, is an endless process where teacher accompanies students in their learning, providing alternatives for them to get the goals of the classes. Um, indeed, we have another post that suggests it is an ongoing process, and uh, this is totally true. It entails designing rubrics in order to give an account of students' uh, development. There is a difference between testing, assessment, and evaluation. Yes, that's something we are going to be um, referring to in a couple of minutes. So, so I, I get a very clear sense of uh, what you think about assessment and um, it actually it is related to everything we do with our students um, in the teaching context. So um, having already unveiled some of these visions on language assessment, I want to refer back to how everything started. And when I when I say how it started, I bring upon some of those memories that we collect prior to the pandemic. So we know that in the language classroom, we were so used to having um, our students in the physical uh, premises of the school. Um, we were used to working with them collectively, um, using the uh, regular materials and having them sitting down in desks. There was interaction and many strategies that we implemented in the language classroom. However, the pandemic arrived and indeed everyone had to go through a different reality. Um, some students had the chance to count with their parents supporting their learning processes. Some other students were more isolated and they had to work um, autonomously on the tasks, on the assignments that we as teachers were requesting them to uh, cover and well some other students were taking it easy uh, while we were trying to lead their learning processes so everyone went through a different reality some of us had a hard time uh, when dealing with new technologies or new strategies some other people were already used to them um, so this is a myriad of possibilities the ones that we had to go through the pandemic. And now there is a big question that I believe it's worth asking and, and worth reflecting on. And it is, how is it now? How is it now? So in light of this panorama, now I want that we become aware of the multiple situations that we had to face um, during this two years, one year and a half in which we needed to um, refer to virtual processes of, of language learning. Uh, we saw situations where uh, schools were struggling with such strategies. We saw that the anxiety levels of our students and teachers, I must say, um, increased because of the amount of work or simply because it was a situation where we were not feeling um, safe at all. And little by little, we started retaking the usual processes that we were so used to traditionally um, leading. So in light of this and, and taking all of these into account, I want to primarily uh, remark the fact that all of us, regardless the grades, uh, the population that we work with, all of us where and our current heroes at home. So I want that you feel proud of how much you gave to your students and how much uh, all of these situation has meant 
for our professional um, development. With this, I now want to ask a question to our audience. And uh, uh, I, I want three, two or three people to answer the question if possible. And taking into account that we are bilingual teachers, um, the question is going to be uh, given in Spanish, but please feel free to answer either in Spanish or, or in English. So this is my, my first question of, of the session and the question goes to, to all of you. So feel free again to open and turn on the microphones. En el último año hemos experimentado nuevas formas de enseñar, de interactuar y sin duda algunas eh, de evaluar. Bajo esta perspectiva, ¿qué impactos cree usted generó la pandemia en los procesos de evaluación de los aprendizajes de nuestros estudiantes? ¿Qué cambios, qué efectos, eh, qué posibilidades se aperturaron a partir de la situación de pandemia en términos de, de evaluación? Entonces, mis estimados eh, profesores, ¿qué podemos reflexionar, qué podemos mencionar al respecto? Tenemos aquí algunas herramientas, podemos levantar la mano o simplemente abrir nuestro micrófono para participar. Yes, please, Professor Berta Ramos. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, profe. Muy contento de tenerte también acá en el espacio. No, muchas gracias a ti por venir. Y bueno, yo, mmm, mirando la pregunta que tú haces, yo creo que ¿qué impactos generó la pandemia en los procesos de evaluación de los estudiantes, de los aprendizajes de nuestros estudiantes? Yo creo que esto es, esto, esto, yo lo vería como desde dos perspectivas. Um, yo creo que después de la pandemia tuvimos como la posibilidad de repensar otras posibilidades de evaluación de los procesos de aprendizaje. Porque, por ejemplo, si estábamos acostumbrados a, a solo evaluar a través de tests, ¿no? Eh, esto, esto evidentemente nos movió el piso y, y nos hizo repensar otras posibilidades más de assessment que de testing, por ejemplo, ¿no? Pero también lo veo como... Como, como que la pandemia, después de la pandemia, los procesos de evaluación de repente eh, empezaron a quedar como en un segundo plano porque creo yo que fue tal el conflicto emocional de la pandemia que que empezamos a, pe a pensar en, 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 en todo desde una perspectiva más humana y menos instruccional, y eso de cierta manera afectó los procesos evaluativos. Um, yo lo vería como por ahí, ¿no? Eh, pero creo que esa es, la, esa es la pregunta del millón, ¿no? Espero que, que en el libro que, que, que ya traes para la feria del libro haya unas luces de respuestas. <risa> Sí, sí, señora. Eso, eso intentamos con la, la propuesta que, que planteamos allí eh, y me parece muy interesante lo que mencionas sobre la parte más humana, el uso de, de nuevas estrategias que tal vez en el pasado no teníamos eh, muy en cuenta eh, y que pues evidentemente vimos los impactos en, en los conocimientos, en el aprendizaje de nuestros estudiantes. Eh, muchos reportes han señalado que en, en ese periodo de tiempo de la pandemia, eh, las posibilidades de aprendizaje para todos fueron, fueron diferentes y los resultados, pues, al final de cuentas no, no fueron eh, muy positivos y muchos profes han tenido que, eh, digamos, arreglárselas para reponer todo ese tiempo, todas esas falencias que se presentaron, eh, que no es tarea fácil y creo que todos estamos tratando todavía de abordarlas en nuestras clases. Sí. Muchas gracias, vale. profe, profe Berta. Thanks for being here and 
I was answering the question in Spanish because it was in Spanish. And, and, and also because uh, I think students, uh, we, we have students in here, so they may feel free to talk in any language. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I have Sonia. She has raised her hand. So, yes, uh, yeah, I'm here. Please. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I will provide the, uh, the answer also in Spanish. Um, sí, como decía la profe Berta, estoy de acuerdo con ella y esto eh, cambió eh, en todos los sentidos, ¿no? tanto en las prácticas docentes como eh, en las prácticas de enseñanza. Pienso que eh, los, cuando hablamos de los procesos de assessment, ¿cierto? hablamos más de ese acompañamiento que hacemos a los estudiantes. Antes de la pandemia siempre estábamos haciendo estos ejercicios, estos estos espacios tutoriales de forma presencial, ¿no? Eh, en la pandemia sí o sí tuvimos que hacerlo de forma virtual, pero creo que esto llegó también para quedarse. Entonces, después de pandemia, hemos visto cómo eh, no solo los espacios de assessment eh, en persona o presenciales funcionan, sino que también los espacios virtuales o tutoriales. Eso también conlleva a que los estudiantes también eh, tengan de, de autonomía. Entonces, desarrollar procesos de autonomía, tanto del docente como de los estudiantes, y también nos lleva a reflexionar sobre sus propios procesos de, de aprendizaje. Creo que eh, también eh, nos permitió a nosotros los docentes eh, sobre pensar y repensar sobre nuevas posibilidades eh, de cómo evaluar y como dice la profesora Berta, eh, de una manera quizá un poco más cualitativa, menos sumativa, eh, que esto es lo que precisamente habla el assessment. Pero eh, creo que en el momento actual, eh, este tema es bien, bien importante, ¿no? Porque nos permite nuevamente reflexionar eso que nos dejó la pandemia, pero que ahora estamos en la presencialidad y qué otras posibilidades podemos implementar teniendo en cuenta... Eh, todo lo que nosotros recibimos día a día y que de todas maneras eh, todo el apoyo tecnológico, todo el apoyo de la virtualidad está ahí, ¿cierto? Entonces, eh, ¿cómo nosotros podemos integrar todas estas prácticas eh, en el desarrollo de nuestras clases y nuestras prácticas de enseñanza? Muy valioso lo que nos, nos comentas, profe Sonia. Eh, eh, definitivamente estamos para continuar explorando todas las posibilidades que tengamos a la mano. Eh, y como tú decías, nos dimos cuenta que era una necesidad empezar a desarrollar procesos más formativos y que, por supuesto, eh, generaran una serie de aprendizajes mucho más consolidados. Entonces, eh, pues te agradezco también por, por tu intervención. So, um, with what we have uh, mentioned and we have been able to gather from these uh, interventions and the experiences, um, I need to address something that we can find in the literature uh, from local studies um, in Colombia. For example, professors uh, Giraldo Macias and, and Herrera and Professor uh, Carvajal um, they suggest that there is indeed a salient need to promote language assessment literacy within the ELT community. And um, there seems to be a gap, uh, a very identified gap between the theory and practice. Theoretically speaking, we talk about formative strategies, formative process of language um, learning and assessment. Uh, but in practice, sometimes uh, this doesn't come very easily. And in certain contexts, it's because the teacher is not knowledgeable on the matter, but because he or she has difficulties with uh, the institutional stakeholders, or probably because, yeah, language assessment literacy is not something which um, is um, very strong in his practice, in his or her practice. Uh, so this is one point um, I wanted to address. Another point is that most local studies on language assessment report that the results of pedagogical initiatives of this kind um, are most often conducted in higher education contexts, um, which is also why 
I believe it's paramount to conduct research within institutions to be able to unveil the realities that our students and teachers alike are facing concerning language assessment. Also, there is a third point that I think it's uh, important to mention, and it is how paramount um, we need to find uh, the level of importance to enhance a broader understanding of assessment uh, in the country. One where we find possibilities and implications that necessarily take place in, in the language classroom. Obviously, these possibilities um, are of, of many different perspectives. Some of them will occur by working together with uh, students, enhancing more autonomous learning, but also connecting um, with parents and making institutional stakeholders aware of the importance of conducting different um, formative strategies in, in, in assessment. Uh, finally, uh, there is also uh, an article that suggests that self-assessment impacts positively students' language learning process, which is why we can take this as one of the best possibilities to enhance language learning. With uh, this quick overview, quick but general overview of what the literature tells us um, in Colombia, uh, now I think it's time to move on to a conceptualization on uh, language assessment. We will be addressing some of the terms that you have already um, um, commented on in this space. So we have in this slide assessment, tests, measurements, and evaluations. And, and I wonder, are they interchangeable terms? So I am sure because of the ideas you have already provided that we understand that tests is one of these strategies, is one of the instruments that we often use in the classroom to observe, to describe, to collect data um, characteristics of what the student um, has learned throughout uh, the academic period or the academic uh, term. But we are also aware that a test is a narrower concept than assessment. So uh, as one of you mentioned, assessment is an umbrella term that involves all of these uh, concepts that we are mentioning and tests is just one piece, I would say metaphorically, one piece of the puzzle um, that sometimes we can refer to when conducting assessment in the classroom. We also have um, measurement, and in terms of measurement, we also describe what the student has learned, but usually um, this is given uh, by means of qualitative labels or categories and uh, not by numbers. Uh, and here we are able to get a glimpse of how many of the goals, how many of the objectives were finally uh, targeted and achieved by the student in class. Once again, it's important to highlight that assessment is a broader term than test or measurement because not all types of assessments um, yield measurements. And, and this is a characteristic that uh, formative strategies have. And it is that we don't necessarily have to be uh, conducting activities or leading strategies with a view to obtaining a given measurement. And we will talk about some of those possibilities um, in a few minutes. Evaluation is also a term that sometimes we equate um, with that of assessment. Um, and, and evaluation, you know, when, when we talk about evaluation with our students, uh, we think of it as a process that is conducted by the teacher. But through this, that evaluation is something that we should implement also with our students to allow me the repetition, evaluate our own practices in the language classroom. How do my students view um, 
uh, me as a teacher, how do they view the contents? How do they view the activities, the assessment strategies being used? And how does it resonate with the goals that we have initially um, tackled in a given course? Also, how do parents see um, uh, the class development, the strategy development? How do coordinators, institutional stakeholders view um, the process being conducted by the teacher? So evaluation is a way to um, look in at the goals and the perspectives of the people that participate in um, the language learning process in order to improve um, how these objectives are, are being tackled. An assessment, and I, I refer to Nikto and Brookhart who provide um, this great um, conceptual map on what assessment is, uh, has different possibilities, but essentially it serves the purpose of obtaining information and hopefully, which is something that sometimes does not happen in time, hopefully can lead to making decisions concerning our students, concerning the curricula, our teaching programs, the schools, and ultimately um, the policies. We know that in most of our classrooms, we have students with a great diversity of skills, of interests, of capacities. And even though it is not easy to address everyone with what we would like or with the quality of materials that we would love to have. It is true that assessment gives us the possibility of taking those uh, differences into account to make the learning process more effective. The curricula can also be assessed. And in, in that sense, we can make decisions concerning the contents, the topics, the goals that we initially set um, for the course or, or the academic term. This can also be related to um, the assessment of how programs are um, enabling students to acquire uh, the skills or um, the knowledge base that we intend to have in our courses. And this will not happen if we don't question also uh, how schools are organized and how policies um, are being set. In language assessment, if we focus particularly in the language classroom, um, we have here on the right side of the screen that we assess through tests, we assess through written reports, through oral presentations, through our students' performance on a homework, but we also assess through informal um, strategies that sometimes can inform in a clearer and more accurate way our students and our parents how the learning process is uh, taking place. So now there comes a second question that I would like to pose to our audience. And this question, I'll paraphrase it in, in English. And I would like to know what aspects do you think we should relearn at schools and universities around the topic of assessment in Colombia? And I leave an additional challenging question, and it is, where do we start? Where shall we start? So I want that you take uh, 30 seconds to think about this. I know it's not an easy question to, uh, to address because of the complexity um, that it has and, and, and the many aspects it involves. Um, but let's think about one or two ideas that come to mind about the things that we need to relearn at schools and institutions in, in general. Uh, so once again, we open the floor. And please, if you want to participate, I don't know. I see Nancy and Sonia uh, raising their hands. So please, if, if you did it intentionally, the floor is all yours. Yeah, John, I'm trying to turn my camera on, but I, it seems to have a, a problem or an issue. Uh, so nice meeting you, first of all, and thank you for 
reading part of the work that we have also done in the field um, to contribute. So it's it's an honor that you were able to approach that work. And then I think that one of the challenges that we are experiencing has to do with um, national policies. You know, what, what are the national policies and um, the guidelines that they offer to educational institutions? And we have a big issue now with Prueba Saber. Right. So what is the goal of Prueba Saber? And I have listened to different primary school and secondary school teachers talking about the anxiety that children experience. So then the last year we had the opportunity to talk to Gloria Carrasco, the advisor of the Minister of Education back in the day. And then uh, we were expressing that concern. It was parents and teachers and students speaking about that anxiety that they experience when presenting the test. So the question is, what is the purpose and the goal of the test? If the purpose is ranking universities or ranking high schools and trying to make a comparison and put these institutions to compete, so that is going to influence the ways we teach and the, the ways we evaluate or test or assess in the classroom, right? So that is a major issue and that's like at a, at a national level kind of discussion. And then if we bring it down into the teachers, uh, what is in the teachers hands in terms of making decisions so again what i usually hear of, of in-service teachers is that they need to respond to in institutional expectations of them passing the pruebas of it right so then the ways in which they teach the language and the ways in which they measure it is through tests right so there is not any other possibility where they want to of course they might offer some feedback and they might you know like uh, gather with the students or something like that, but it's still at the core or the center of the teaching practice is testing because they need to respond to the national demands in terms of the pruebas of it, right? So I think that that is, that is one of the things. So my, my call would be, so let's keep on bringing these conversations, like um, something that I really loved about Asokopi back in the day, it was the capacity to engage with the Minister of Education. And I remember one of the, where the, one of the, the, contributions of Asokopi was in terms of bilingualism. So like th the work of our scholars was really put into dialogue with the Minister of Education, calling them up over, hey, wh wh why, wh what is it that we call bilingualism in a multilingual and multicultural country? So probably we could also, as Asokopi as, as or any association or institutions or master's programs, we could engage in dialogue again with the Minister of Education, like, hey, let's think about assessment in these terms and even more due to the fact of all the things that you have been mentioning before, right? Like pandemics, the pandemics has left us with like our anxiety and a lot of losses that we have not been able to grieve, plus other, you know, emotional and mental health problems and issues. So now what we are trying to do is, yeah, how do we develop the skills that were not developed during the pandemics because teaching was not effective, right? And how do we keep track of that? And how do we then approach assessment in those terms? So yeah, so that's part of the reflection. And I apologize if I extended myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Nancy. Yeah, I think it was remarkable. And um, it makes me think about what teachers are saying also um, in our department in, in, in WILA, um, because we have similar realities where uh, the class becomes a way to tackle those um, expectations, standards that sometimes or most of the time hinder the possibilities, the chances that the teacher has to develop what he or she wants to develop, right? Uh, and it's not preparing to um, present a test to be measured by a test, but it's really conducting a formative uh, process. So I find your intervention very, very meaningful. Thank you so much. If anyone else would like to answer um, the question, please, this is the time uh, to do it. We, we can um, listen to you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna move forward, and probably in the next couple of minutes, we have the chance to listen to someone else. So um, now, uh, th there is a question that I bring about, I, I bring into discussion here, and it's where does fairness uh, come about? How how can we incorporate 
um, fair practices, which is uh, in the title of, of this um, space? How can we embrace them in order to have better formative assessment uh, processes? So I think that one way to begin to think about new possibilities is to take into account the questions that I ask myself as a teacher surrounding the assessment processes before, prior to beginning a course. Sometimes we think of assessment when we receive the results or when we are able to analyze the results from, from our students. But one of the challenges that we often find is that it is too late. And yeah, as, as teachers, we are always too busy. We collect tons of information from our students, tons of assignments, tons of homework. And with that information, uh, we can lead good assessment processes, but sometimes it's too late to make decisions. And one opportunity that I believe it's important to um, always have in mind is to start asking those questions, not only throughout the process, but prior to beginning the process. What are those challenges that I may encounter uh, with my students? What are those challenges that my students themselves uh, may encounter with the objectives, with the material, with the content, with the standards that they need to um, somehow follow um, in order to have fairer practices in, in, in the classroom? In line with this, uh, uh, you know, thinking about those questions prior to beginning a course, I believe it is essential to think about the what. What is it that um, I want to teach? What is it that I want to include in my lesson plans, in my syllabus, in la malla curricular que tengamos en nuestras instituciones educativas? What is it and how is that relationship um, established? Um, around the goals that we as a team have or, or we as teachers have um, in the subjects that, that we lead. That question of the what is it that I am willing to, to develop also comes hand in hand with another set of questions and it is that of why and what for. Multiple are the occasions when uh, we find that some of our students struggle to find um, meaning in the contents that, that we are teaching them, or perhaps that they feel a disconnection between what is being taught in the classroom and the social, cultural, political reality of uh, their own social environment, of the social spectrum. So it is worth pondering upon the reasons why we are teaching um, our students so that we can define um, strategies that can involve them more in our course and can make learning meaningful. I, I am a total believer that whenever we are engaged with something or someone, it becomes of our interest and then motivation increases, allowing the process to be um, more effective. Similarly, there is another question that we as teachers are constantly thinking of, and it is the how. So uh, when we are designing our classes in those weeks, las semanas institucionales, or, or uh, on the weekends prior to beginning uh, a new lesson, uh, we often think about the materials, we often think about, um, you know, the activities that I want to, um, to develop. So the how is, is also paramount. The how needs to be connected with the reasons why I'm teaching what I'm teaching in, in my English class. And, and this connection is important to be built as long as the possibility exists with the students themselves. Um, I know that theoretically on multiple times we have read that students need to become active participants of the learning process. Um, but 
there is an assumption that the teacher is the one that establishes the syllabus from the beginning or the course plan or the lesson plan from the beginning. And sometimes the interest or the voices from our students are not heard in that initial stage. Perhaps it is heard as we go through the course, but in that initial stage, it is not. So uh, this can be a possibility. Uh, this can be an opportunity to um, try to think about that incorporation from the beginning. So perhaps when we end the course and, and if we are meant to teach it again um, to a different group of students, we can consult our students' opinions on how the course was, how the content was, the materials, the strategies, the activities um, in order to make uh, changes. Now, there is something that uh, is related to how we design our lessons and, and, and we conduct our assessment processes. And it is that of the assessment uh, purposes that, that we set for, for our lessons for, for the course. And, and in those purposes, I um, encourage our teachers to lead formative processes that enable you to have you know, a base upon which you can work together with the students um, to improve and, and, and to make our teaching more effective. I need to make a, a disclaimer here. And it is, you know, the idea is not to disregard, at least entirely, the idea is not to disregard entirely the use of summative uh, strategies, because sometimes it becomes necessary to use strategies from both um, spectrums. But I think, I personally think it becomes a problem when assessment is only based on summative um, strategies because there is no time, there is no time and no way to uh, allow our students to improve as we go through the course. Um, just to remember a bit on the concept of formative and summative assessment, we know that a formative approach to assessment um, intends to monitor the progress and to provide constant feedback on our students' uh, performance. A summative approach to language assessment uh, has as its priority measuring the overall performance and understanding. Uh, and as we just reflected, measuring often occurs at the end. And well, at the end, there is not much time to make changes, um, uh, both for the teacher and, and for the student. The timing is also um, an element that we need to pay attention to. The timing is during the learning process, monthly, quarterly, right? Whereas on the summative approach, we find that the, t the timing is sometimes periodically, but it's often at the end of the year or the academic term, which again hinders other possibilities to, to arise. How do students view both of these perspectives? Often we find that a formative approach is viewed as something that enhances performance, that allows students to um, make the most out of feedback, they know where are the areas that they need to improve? What are those aspects they need to reinforce? And thus, together with the teacher, they can work to improve um, on these aspects. On the summative approach, we see that um, students often find that standard, you know, that it somehow sums up the achievement of uh, something. And in, in most cases, we have that this is given through a number or in other uh, grading systems, we find this through a letter, as you can um, see that on the picture. And um, it, 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 it is summed up through a final grade. Examples of both of these approaches on the formative side, we find that, well, I, I find it funny that uh, we place the quizzes on, on this part of the slide, but quizzes with a formative um, uh, purpose. Uh, draft of essays, proposals or plans, uh, peer and self-assessments that come, come about as, as important strategies to use, uh, classroom polls, 
informal talks, uh, conferences, the use of rubrics that are collectively constructed, all of them take shape um, from a formative uh, perspective. On the summative side, we find the famous mid or end of term exams, the final, final, final essays when they are not constructed through a uh, process, final reports, final assignments, final projects. Um, and, and sometimes, for example, uh, I place here the portfolios because the portfolio is an excellent tool when it has a formative purpose. But think about a portfolio where the student collects and collects and collects information that is only revised at the end by uh, the teacher. So it, once again, it is a great strategy, but the purpose in that sense is not as useful as it could be with a um, formative approach. And I remark here in yellow that information is often too little and or it is often too late. So it may not be that constructive for um, our students. In our book, the book that we constructed from a research um, study back in 2019, uh, 2018 and 2019 with a group of students from our university, um, we were able to think about some principles that we think can inform and can lead to better formative um, alternative assessment processes in the language classroom. So uh, just to give you a glimpse of, of the content um, of what the book uh, provides, we think it's important to make of assessment a permanent uh, process. We have already addressed of how important it is to do ongoing assessments, not at the end, but through multiple strategies and that it happen in time so that changes and decisions can be taken. A process that only gives us a final result is a process where uh, we don't have much space to, um, to act. There is a second principle and it is that of democracy or democratic um, assessment practices. How many times do we consult um, the assessment strategies with our students? How many times do we co-construct rubrics or how a given project, a given portfolio, a given task is going to be assessed? Um, how many times do we give our students the chance to also self-assess or co-assess the work of another uh, partner? So all of these are elements that um, come into a democratic perspective of assessment, involving students and making them active participants, not only at the level of activities, but also at the moment of uh, providing assessment. Their voices are also important, and that is why they are one more uh, key element in the teaching and the learning process. Assessment shall be heterogeneous. It has to be diverse. The more diversity, the multiplicity of um, instruments, of strategies that we use is going to lead to in-time decisions and also better informed decisions in the classroom. Um, when we are able to enhance the capacities of our students, not only on a single scale, then we are able to get a greater picture, a greater glimpse of um, their performance and also the achievements um, throughout a course. So heterogeneous is an invitation to um, provide multiple opportunities for assessment. Assessment indeed has to be feedback oriented. We can have a portfolio, we can have an essay, we can have a project um, as one of the strategies at school with a very formative purpose. But if feedback is not taken into account or is not given the necessary importance, uh, our students are not going to be nurtured by that assessment strategy. Feedback comes about when we are able to tell um, our pupils 
what areas need to be strengthened, what strategies they can um, relate to improve um, um, those elements that perhaps they are not very strong or very good at. And uh, also we are able to tell them what is going on, what is wrong. So feedback allows you and the student to not only become aware of the achievement of the goals, but also to find a common space to see what strategies can be implemented to alleviate, let's say, um, such weaknesses. We have an important element and it is empathetic. Assessment needs to be empathetic. And uh, we were able to collect information from our students where they suggested that sometimes they viewed assessment as a threat or sometimes when they start a course, they don't feel very strong with certain topics. And that is like already falling behind in a race that they are uh, deciding to run, but in which they have already some challenges uh, to tackle. So making of assessment an empathetic process is becoming aware of such necessities that our students bring about from previous learning processes and trying to help them to strive through their own uh, learning. When there is empathy, there are greater chances to learn. And I think that um, when we are comfortable learning, we, we feel supported by our teachers and our colleagues, we are able to have um, better results than when we are left in isolation. An additional principle is that assessment um, shall be illustrative. It has to be um, clear for the student. It has to be understandable. It has to be comprehensive. Um, also, it has to be exhaustive. Uh, that is why not a single instrument like a test at the end of an academic term or at a fixed date uh, works sometimes as an illustrative um, assessment strategy. So it depends on the purpose and the timing that we set up for such assessments um, to work effectively. Assessment also um, should be flexible, understanding that all of us go through different circumstances and that all of us are different. We have strengths and weaknesses and we try to make our best um, to tackle these um, elements. Now, we are not suggesting that assessment has to be easy, and, and I come back to illustrative, uh, because the idea is not uh, that we set goals and then just because we are being formative, then it means that we are being lenient. Uh, we don't have to go to that, um, you know, uh, part of the wall. Uh, but it does have to be flexible, understanding uh, the circumstances that sometimes take place in the classroom. Assessment is an opportunity to enhance the integral part of education. Assessment works also and, and encourages, um, you know, teachers and students alike to become citizens of the world, to become um, uh, better students uh, with everyone and to establish better social relationships with others. Um, so assessment is one of the ways in which we can contribute um, to making this uh, possible. Assessment uh, should be motivating. And, and, and here we have heard about internal and external motivation. And I believe that all of us are aware of how hard it is sometimes for some students to um, get engaged or be motivated uh, because of a variety of reasons um, always take place, uh, be it circumstances at home or perhaps be it circumstances from the past that do not allow them to be highly motivated with what we teach. So when assessment is motivating, it enables the student to keep track of their process and also um, be aware of those possibilities that we as teachers uh, can give them. One more principle is that um, assessment needs to be authentic. So connecting the authenticity of the activities of the material and of assessment itself um, is trying to ensure 
that the what, the how, and the why questions that we had previously uh, displayed come together and give the student the necessary amount of information to uh, work on his process. So as you can see, we have 10 principles that I've tried to summarize, um, but that you may be able to find you know, more in-depth um, or developed more in-depth in uh, the book where we displayed this proposal, um, again, that we obtained from a research study conducted at the university. Fairness is um, one element that we initially talked about as well. And to do this in the language classroom, it's important to begin by writing clear learning outcomes. I am going to ask you just a moment because my computer is about to run out of battery. So just give me 30 seconds, John, and I will pause uh, here just for a moment. Sure, Professor, don't worry. Okay, very well. So uh, how to keep on enhancing fairness um, concerning assessment in the classroom? Writing clear learning outcomes from the beginning and hopefully uh, mediated by a conversation with our students is a good way to um, begin taking baby steps to getting fairer uh, practices in the classroom. Assessing what we teach, our students reported that sometimes in certain courses, they had assessment strategies where the relationship between the content of the subject that they were um, studying was not or had no connection with what the teachers were requesting them to do. So they felt lost. They didn't feel um, comfortable with uh, those assessment strategies. So it's important that we assess what we teach. One of our students uh, suggested and, and, and brought some memories from the past uh, where he said that um, in, in some of his classes, one thing was to stay in the classroom and to be studying the content and a totally surprise was what would be um, a final test. So this, this you know, um, huge gap was something that uh, hindered the possibilities he had in, in the class. Uh, there is another element, and it is that two, three, or four is better than one. And this totally relates with the amount of um, strategies that we use, or, or elements, as you may want to call them, that we use to obtain information from our um, students. Helping students understand what they need to do. It's great to take our time to uh, sometimes clarify uh, the instructions that we have given. Sometimes, if there is not a good report among students, among students and teachers, then uh, questions may arise, but they may never happen in the language classroom. So it's always good to approach them and try to see if uh, there are any doubts concerning what we are telling them to do. Motivating our students is not something that we need to stop doing. We actually need to enhance motivation all the time. Uh, and more because of, of the situations that you already mentioned here in, in your interventions. Plenty of students after the pandemic uh, have reported having mental health issues um, or sometimes when they are not supported by their parents, be it primary, secondary or undergraduate students, um, this can generate problems. Uh, and those problems sometimes if we are not aware uh, can affect the learning process um, in, in a bad way. So motivating them is, is a good way to keep track of how they are feeling and how um, they are also connected to, to our lessons. Interpret assessment results uh, properly. Uh, so this is more for the context of um, um, schools when we uh, you know uh, hold meetings with our parents or 
or um, or coordinators or um, area leaders uh, that sometimes as as Professor Nancy Carvajal mentioned, because of the general standards that have been set um, from the policies and the institutions themselves, an assessment or the results of an assessment can be misinterpreted. And then the person who is um, to be blamed is the teacher or even the student. So, uh, you know, allowing a better interpretation of, of an assessment result is is important and i think that things may change entirely um, if we try to be very clear with the students concerning the purpose that we have set um, for a given uh, course or, or a given plan in in our institutions but also uh, working together with the institution itself is paramount in order for this not to be uh, misinterpreted or, or not to be finding the guilty ones at the end, because this is not about fin finding the guilty, again, which is often uh, uh, blamed on, on, on the teachers. Uh, but it's about enhancing effective uh, teaching practices so that learning also uh, becomes um, effective. And evaluating the results of your assessment practices. So. Um, this is also taking into account the students' voices, um, not only the voices from, from what coordinators um, claim about our practices, but getting and collecting those ideas in order to keep on improving. Um, so this is, this is one um, element that I wanted to take, and the reference is from uh, Suski 2000. Um, now that we are about to pass to to a space where we will have the chance to interact um, i want to remind everyone about the strategies that we can take when conducting formative um, assessment processes um, we know that assessment can take shape of a formal assessment so this is when um, we deliberately plan something and we have an already set of uh, activities of uh, projects with our students and the point of this formal assessment is to give uh, finally um, some feedback but also we don't have to forget that assessment can be informal so this happens when we often have interactions with our students in the classroom uh, when we talk to them how they are feeling about the course how they are doing with the material um, what challenges are they having um, because, you know, learning is not limited to what a student shows to us, but sometimes there are other areas that we can start exploring to enhance that learning. Part of the task of enhancing formal and informal assessment opportunities happen by communicating clear learning goals. This is one of the ideas we have remarked um, today collecting evidence of the learning, making decisions and adapting our teaching for future lessons, giving in-time feedback um, that is generative, that is descriptive, and also involving our students in the construction of rubrics, checklists, uh, guides, um, concept maps that we can have to um, generate assessment. Peer assessment is another area um, that I find important to enhance in the classroom and is giving them the opportunity to take a look at the process of a peer and taking into account the goals that were previously um, set, then we can evaluate and give an account of his or her own uh, process. I place one definition taken from Elliot 2000 here, and I quote that, Peer assessment is an arrangement for peers to consider the level, the value, the worth, the quality or successfulness of the products or the outcomes of learning of others of uh, similar status. How can we do this? Understanding the goals, once again, is paramount. Setting a clear assessment criteria, be it co-constructed or constructed by the teacher, but giving it to the student prior to having the assessment strategy implemented Participating in classroom discussions 
um, where multiple pieces of evidence are collected and also provided uh, feedback that can allow students to um, move forward. So this is the way to um, conduct uh, peer assessment. Uh, some, some of the challenges that we may find when doing this is to prepare the students because um, imagine that we are working with primary students. They may not be that prepared to give the I mean, to give a uh, an assessment of a peer uh, if we haven't taken the time to, to model at least in the classroom how we shall be done, what we are expecting from them to do, um, etc. And the self-assessment that cannot be missed uh, from these practices um, allows the student to reflect on his own learning or her own learning. Uh, also, see how much effort they have been investing in their um, succeeding of the goals. Um, and additionally, becoming aware of those strategies that they can incorporate for their own uh, benefit. Once again, it is clear to have the criteria set, um, a self-evaluation format, and a process of reflection that is um, encouraged by the teacher. Some of the useful tools that I think uh, can be incorporated here are the rubrics. Um, some of them can be informal rather than judgmental, um, but for all of us, I think it, it, it works when we have uh, templates or some anonymous exemplars where students do not necessarily have to know um, who evaluated um, their process. And now that we have given this conceptualization, now that we have uh, reflected on two of the questions that I already made, um, I would like that we now have a 15 minute space um, to go to a set of breakout rooms. And what we will do is to analyze a case, well, a, a set of cases to be more precise, three cases that I have displayed on a Canva. So to do this, I'm going to request um, dear teachers to scan this QR code, um, but also I want to give you the, um, the link um, that you can access to, to view um, you know, the cases that we are going to um, analyze today. So let me just ask you if the QR code is working for everyone. So John, I don't know if you opened it already. I'm going to verify, Professor. Once I come back, maybe. Mm -hmm. And also I'm going to share it here in the chat. So you can tell me if you can visualize from your computers or from your devices, if it's actually um, working here. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor, it works. <coughs> okay, thank you, John. So, right, the invitation now is that we are going to be finding uh, three different cases. Let me see if I can stop sharing here and Okay, uh, and John has prepared three different breakout rooms. I think it will be automatically assigned. So um, we have uh, 519. I think we are going to have the chance to read each of the cases. There are three cases, and the idea is that we take around five minutes per case. So by uh, 535, we will be coming back to this general uh, meeting. And, and again, the idea is that you read the case and then you can reflect on the possibilities that you as a teacher would find under such uh, circumstances. These cases have been taken from uh, different contexts, um, different scenarios. So I, I want that with your expertise um, or also with your background knowledge, you can help your other colleagues in the breakout room find strategies um, to improve, to tackle the situation that is being displayed um, in each of the cases. Um, so John, you can already send us to the breakout rooms and we come back at 5.35 to the main room.
Okay, how many shall we open? Three? It's fine? Um, yeah, yeah, I think three three is perfect. Okay, so you're going to be sent automatically to one, uh, to these uh, places. So mm -hmm. one, two, three. And if you can set the timer, perhaps uh, 12 minutes, it can be, I think it can be enough. Okay, Professor. Here it goes. Okay, so you can begin joining the rooms or in 10 seconds it will. Okay, Professor, I think it worked. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, I wanted to ask you, I was in another um, room, so I don't know if I can, if I can go back. back to uh, yes. which, which one was it? Um, Marcela, I remember that Marcela and Sonia, they were in, in that room, so I don't know if you can see the members. Okay, that is the room number one. So let me. There you go. John. Hola, mi profe, sí. I couldn't open. I couldn't open the the uh, Canva neither. Oh, okay, teacher, don't worry. So I'm going to copy the link and paste it maybe over here. Yeah, but maybe uh, to WhatsApp because uh, okay, it's impossible for me to see the the links. Okay, teacher, don't worry. I send it now. And here it goes. That's it.
Uh, professor, the groups, they are getting close, but the issue with, with teams is that it takes a lot of time. It's kind of like slow. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I don't know why um, it's sometimes a bit complex with, with Microsoft Teams. But all, all of the rooms were already closed, John, or? Are They're we getting close. From... Mm -hmm. It oh, goes okay. from one to the other, so it goes progressively. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me try to share the, um, the final uh, slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's over here. Oh, but we were... Yeah. Okay, John, um, are you able to see the full screen? Yes, Professor, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So I don't know how many cases were you able to, uh, to discuss in, in your groups, um, but I, I would like just, just to give five minutes from, from our session. We are about to close, uh, but I would like to listen from some of you um, you know, the perspectives that you were able to gather from any of these three cases. And, and I can display the case if you want me to. Um, so we had one case that was related to achieving, you know, the um, uh, national results. Uh, we had another one where one student was responsible, punctual, disciplined, but, but she was not doing well with, with uh, uh, tests. And uh, we also had the third case, and this one was about a teacher that, you know, graduated from the university, started working at a public institution, um, but then, you know, he or she is dealing with, with something concerning um, honesty. So I don't know if, if you want to address any of the cases or if you want to make a comment on any of the cases, and if you do, please um, raise your hand and, and, and tell us now before we start closing. Let me see if I can show the, the cases again. So this is this is case number one. So any any comments, any any summary of what you discussed in your groups? Anything worth remarking from those conversations? Yes, Jimmy, please. Good to see you. Oh yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'd like to say, so I would like to say something about case number three. Okay, so let me, yes, here we are. So, uh, I think that I, I have found myself in that, in the same position. And, well, what I'd say is that we should not, like, let fear, like, take over uh, our willingness to do something new. And also, uh, I think that we have to take that leap of, of faith and probably start changing. Like, if we let the students know that we trust them, uh, maybe they uh, will they start seeing this self-assessment practice as something different. And yes, so uh, if overall, let's just take a chance and go for it. Okay, thank you so much, Jimmy. Yeah, those are the words that I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves of um, when we struggle with um, some colleagues or perhaps uh, coordinators or parents, or even the students sometimes uh, can make one feel this way, right? Um, so thank you for your comments. I don't know if there is any, any additional uh, comment or idea that you would like to provide on any of the cases.
Okay, let me switch it to uh, case number two. This one made us think. I was discussing um, this case with Marcela, uh, and and you know we had different visions on on what to do. You know what to try to do with a student that has all of these wonderful qualities, but then in the classroom, you know when the time comes, it's hard to find um, you know a great achievement. Yeah, teacher Sonia, please. Okay. Yeah. So I have the opportunity to discuss in the in the room, but I was reading the three cases. Of course, all of them are really interesting, but I, it was the one that caught my attention the most because uh, every one of us has had a student in this position, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe there is a lot to do in this regard because we have to think about a lot about what is it that we are going to do with that student. So um, we do everything but maybe one possibility is to okay uh, to work individually with the student uh, to be able to listen to, uh, to his or her own self uh, assessment also maybe to prepare as you said uh, rubrics are really important not only mm -hmm. okay uh, rubrics for self evaluation and also rubrics for uh, the teaching or and learning process okay uh, so to provide him or her with a variety of materials with purpose, as you said, yeah, with a specific purpose in order to identify which are those weaknesses and to be able to provide him or her with opportunities uh, for improvement. But they are really interesting cases because uh, maybe they are challenging for the students and for teachers as well. Nowadays, for example, I have a group of students and they are having they are having different difficulties. OK, so I have been uh, working with them uh, uh, in the assessment process in order to help them overcome those situations. So, for example, to be able if I if they, for example, present an exam to be able to talk to them and to be able to identify to make them able and aware to identify their own mistakes in order to see if they are learning or not. Interesting, teacher Sonia. Thank you so much for your mm -hmm. comments and and your experiences, and and yeah, yeah, I think your ideas are great because sometimes we take it for granted that the materials or the activities that we are using for assessment um, are effective, and and as we suggested at the beginning, it's not about again becoming lenient, permissive. Right, the results are the results, and it's okay. Uh, but maybe the problem or the issue with this student is uh, perhaps that you know the teaching process has been taken in a linear way, and we have assumed, or this teacher has assumed, that uh, the student has enough with what he or she has been given. Right? Uh, maybe the student has a problem or any difficulty that we have not been able to identify. And, and you know, your idea is interesting because you say, you suggest that this assessment process should be differentiated. We need to get closer to the student. And if the results are the same, then perhaps the student becomes aware that something is not going well and more time, more work needs to be um, invested. But chances are also that we find an alternative reality that we had no idea of. And, uh, you know, therefore the student would keep on having bad and bad and bad and bad results um, there. Uh, you make me think about also the levels of anxiety that some students get when they need to present any um, any test we here in this case we are particularly talking about uh, written tests and um, you know in, in in our research we found students that associated the word test with fear with anxiety with uh, stress with lack of sleep um, so many many problems that, that I think even us as teachers uh, sometimes we feel when we need to present something that is so, so, so important. Uh, now imagine a student that has to be constantly going through 
um, these assessment strategies. So, so your idea is 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 wonderful, and I and I thank you for for sharing yeah, it with us. But you're right. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so um, to start closing the space, um, I'm going to show the the last couple of, of slides. Um, and, and, and well, here I have a few things to reflect upon some of the challenges that we still have um, in ELT in relation to assessment. And, and these are given in way of, you know, of questions. So how can we or how, how have we integrated uh, technology in our online language classroom or in our language classrooms that sometimes give us space to also uh, encourage virtuality with, with our students. Uh, what advantages or disadvantages have we observed from its use? Now, for example, that um, it becomes very recent, but widely known um, of these uh, artificial intelligences that even if you ask a question such as write an essay or uh, write a reflection, or answer this question to me with these and those characteristics, you can instantly get an answer. So the challenges are, are huge, right? And now the challenges are um, so many that, um, you know, this, this can be uh, hard sometimes to think about. And how can we encourage the use of technology in formative assessment? Um, so I, I just wanna give you a couple of ideas um, technology doesn't have to become an enemy, even though sometimes it depends on the use that the person gives the technology. Um, but we can use it for our own benefit and the benefit of the student's learning process. And this can serve the purpose of monitoring their progress, of identifying misconceptions that they have upon learning, also to provide rapid feedback. So if we have rubrics and we want to save paper and at the same time we want to be able to reach out to every one of our students, well, we can do that very same activity, that very same exercise through an online environment and uh, this will somehow uh, enable us to give them feedback. For, for example, um, let's think about giving feedback that doesn't necessarily have to be written. Why can't we record a video and we send it to our student with my perceptions on um, his activity, his project, his portfolio, et cetera. We can also take that from um, how multimodal learning, learning is and how technology is also allowing these um, opportunities. And also to collect the information from our students learning uh, during the process of, of instruction. I'm sure that we, we explore all of these platforms during the pandemic, Schoology, Edmodo, Camilo, Moodle, Kahoot, Padlet, Google Forms, Formative, um, Socrative, there, there was another one, uh, and many others. So, so the idea is that, you know, sometimes documenting, tracking, and reporting is not easy, but with the help of these um, um, tools, we can ease the process of, of providing feedback and, and ultimately conducting assessment. Um, and finally, the set of challenges and opportunities that I promised to give at the beginning. Um, I think that the challenges that are on the left is that one, we collect accurate information about our students, about how they are learning and how they are doing. That is paramount. Again, um, if we just leave it until the end to have this information, it may be hard to change and make new decisions on um, our teaching processes. A second challenge that I um, relate to this topic is to analyze in a timely manner. Because again, we are always busy. We have meetings. Um, we have to plan, we have to grade, we have a uh, meeting with our parents, we, we have a lot of things to do at school and sometimes we are just too full of things to do, right? So uh, the challenge is to try to keep it simple, to be constant, but also to um, get information from different, different sources. And we need to be aware that assessment doesn't always have to be formal. So you can conduct an activity get an informal assessment for the student, but not necessarily get more and more and more um, full of work. 
And the two previous challenges encompasses a third challenge and it is the making of informed decisions uh, for the teaching process. Those decisions can be taken from the beginning um, or at the end or in the middle, but the idea is to you know, enhance the student's learning. The opportunities is that we provide feedback that is accurate, that is timely, that is actionable, that is clear to the student that he or she knows what are those um, possibilities of improvement that we give our students personalized assessments if that is the chance because sometimes it is not possible if we have a 40 student group but if it is a chance well we can um, try to do that in our lessons and the invitation is to use a greater number of multimodal resources we have lots of possibilities on the internet we have different newsletters and web pages that can help us um, get a greater glimpse um, of this. So um, I want to say thanks uh, to everyone. I, I told John that um, we can have a brief space before finishing with the session for any questions, any comments, any observations. And I finish by inviting everyone, if you are in Bogota, um, to visit us on the 19th of April in Corferias. We will be there with Professor Leonardo and Professor Maroli. Both of them are my colleagues and, and authors of, of this book from Universidad Sur Colombiana. And we would be really, really, really happy to see you there. Um, so I thank everyone for your attendance. Professor, thank, thank you, you very much. Professor, Sonia was about to talk, I think. <laughs> no, no, just to, to say thanks. Thanks a lot. It was really, really interesting. Yes, Professor. Thank you very much. We appreciate your participation and of course because you're having off uh you're giving us part of your time. So it has been very like enriching, I would say. And it's also very like interesting because here we are like making a compilation of recordings in these encounters. So it's like material and information that we are surely going to use in the, for example, applied linguistics classes and and the didactic classes. So we are like profiting from these encounters and of course from your expertise in the field. We are very, very like uh, thankful, Professor, for your participation, for your presentation. This has been very enriching and we know that you have been very like willing also to be here with us. Thanks a lot. The microphone, the microphone is off. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm really happy to be um, working together with, with you. We, um, I mean, from the beginning, since I met you, um, it's, been, it's been a great, you know, field of, of sharing, of learning from one another, um, of writing, of reflecting. Um, so I'm really happy that, that you are leading these um, spaces. And I must say that I'm happy to have had the chance to meet again with uh, some, some other colleagues from the field. Um, I'm happy to see that we also had pre-service teachers and um, definitely the expertise that you are um, given to them in your classes is, is also um, essential. So I thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Professor. But if it is the case that any one of you has any questions, maybe you can make it. We still have uh, some minutes, so it's totally fine. You can open the microphone and let Professor, Professor John uh, know the questions or queries uh, you may have. There is the email, so he is always always like very willing to respond. He is always uh, with a very nice attitude. So if you are like interested in getting to know more information about assessment, like research in this dimension of knowledge, go ahead. <laughs> I, I did read a question though in the um, in the chat, <clears throat> and Jimmy was asking me about uh, the possibility to get an ebook. Uh, Jimmy, I promise you that I'm going to consult this with the university. Um, you know the the copyright process. I, I don't exactly know how that works, but um, if it, if that is a possibility, I'm totally totally sharing this with you. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, like, like to buy, right? The ebook, not to get it for, not to get it for free, <laughs> but to buy. So that that's the question. So thank you, and thank you for your time and such insightful ideas. Yeah, no, thank you, Jimmy, for being here. It was also great to see you because uh, I remember you from the master's program, uh, Jimmy, and, and also the work that you have developed with uh, Professor Maria Fernanda here from, from Universidad Sur Colombiana. And this is like the idea, you know, to have these spaces, to have like the, the logical exercises to make to make network. That is also like the idea. We can exchange ideas. We can exchange uh, like insects, like many things like to continue growing as a, as a community, you know, sometimes we don't have uh, pretty much these spaces, so it's kind of like useful, beneficial uh, having these like encounters from time to time. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Sonia, I think you raised your hand. Yes. No, no, no maybe that wasn't uh, it was yeah, it's like uh, it's, yeah, it's just like a recommendation for Professor John Mosquera. <laughs> so I was. I was a little bit late because, well, I saw like the announcement, let's say, in the página de la licenciatura, but just today. So maybe a little bit more of advertising would probably help for sure. the next session. Mm, sure. And it was very interesting because I was not the person that posted the information. <laughs> it was it was someone in the in the visual degree. Maybe it was Professor Maria Fernanda, uh, but. Now that I saw the advertisement, it would be like also very like interesting to continue like posting the information in our licenciatura because I'm pretty sure that many students would like to, to join, to continue joining us. Uh, for example, in April 28, we are going to have uh, Professor Jose de Mar Alvarez from Universidad del Valle, and he is going to be uh, giving a talk about indigenous students and research with this population at the university level. So I will also like share the information so, so that uh, Professor, your students, and Jimmy, your students, and your people, your community can continue getting engaged in these uh, spaces with us. That sounds amazing, John. Yes, I'll be looking forward to attending those spaces too. Great. So Professor, I think we, ha we don't have any other comment and any other query, so I think we can like stop here. Let me stop the recording. And I'm going to upload the material to YouTube, so I'll